sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause she hung up upon that cross. He parted in the raging, the grave, my God, still rolling stones away. Come on, sing it out. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. You won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the priests. You sing it. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, let's you let's sing it out. We are the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by. of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. Yeah. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. Yeah. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. seat. On behalf of the Creepwood Baptist Church, I would like to welcome you to the ordination service of Tim Wildsmith. This is an amazing thing that we're going to participate in tonight. We have two objectives. One is to worship the God who calls. The other is to celebrate the one who calls, the one who said yes. A genesis of this night actually began about three years ago. I was walking that Bel through Belmont uh, Chapel, and I heard somebody singing, and I thought, man, somebody's really good. It wasn't Tim. Uh, <laughs> Tim, was actually <laughs> Tim was actually doing sound in there, and we, we got to talking, and... Uh, and uh, we figured out that we both knew Brandon Owen, who's here, who's now pastor of First Baptist Church, uh, Marietta, Georgia. And at the time, we were in between music ministers. And so Tim happened to say, hey, my wife and I lead worship. Uh, if you ever need anybody, I said, oh, actually, the next three Sundays would be great. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and they did. And, uh, and about a month later, Tim, Tim came to me and said, Hey, you know, I just really love Creepwood Baptist Church, and I, this is really surprising for me. And uh, and uh, it, he could tell you more about that if he wants to. But um, but I don't know that we could commit with my job and, and and stuff. I don't know if we could commit every Sunday to being here. Would it be possible though for us to lead, continue to lead worship? At the same time, Jody and Chris, who are helping lead us here today, had the exact same conversation with me the exact same week. And, uh, and so the, and the, and the four of them ended up getting together, and we, we hit it off, had a lot of chemistry. And, and from there, Tim and, and Becca and Jody and Chris have become incredible parts of our church. Tim has gotten to preach here. Tim has led a lot of Bible studies here. Uh, Tim uh, has really blessed our church in a lot of ways. About a year ago, Tim came to me and said, hey, would you ever consider ordaining me? I said, you weren't ordained? And uh, he said, no, I'm not. And, 
And so we started having a conversation about what that would look like here. And so for those of you who don't know, we kind of put Tim through a little bit of a ringer. Uh, we had to present him first to the deacons. The deacons had to say yes or no if this person's going to go forward. Uh, our deacons enthusiastically said, yes, we love Tim. This is, this is going to be great. Uh, and then from there, I made Tim write a paper. 18-page paper, to be exact, uh, of, of his theological beliefs. Uh, it was out of that paper that t- uh, Tim was questioned by our deacon ordination council, which was made up of all ordained people uh, within our church and our church congregation. It was a beautiful day. And as a result of that, we brought him before the church. The th- church enthusiastically said, yes, we believe Tim is called by God. It has been set aside uh, to, to become a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's just, and tonight is the culmination of that, the celebration of that. So on behalf of Tim, thank you for being here. I really appreciate you all being here. Uh, there has been a lot of people who've traveled quite a bit. Uh, there has been people who traveled from Nebraska. Nicholas and Jake behind me have traveled from Nebraska all to play up here uh, for, for, uh, f- uh, for Tim's ordination. Uh, Jason traveled from downtown <laughs> at First Nash, which, you know, it's like a whole other country in Cree Falls. So, you know, um, uh, from downtown. And uh, so we appreciate Jason being here. Also with us here today is Heather, Tim's boss at Belmont University. She's the university minister at Belmont. She's going to be speaking to Tim, head of Daughtry. And then Brandon Owen uh, from Georgia. Uh, He's now at First Baptist Marietta, Georgia. We're really still kind of mad at Georgia for stealing you. Um, But uh, I'm glad to see you here uh, this evening. Tim, would you join me on stage? We're going to do a short liturgy, both as, uh, as a church for Tim here. I'm going to lead us through this. And so, Tim, do you promise to seek first the kingdom of God by loving God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength? Do you promise to love and shepherd the people God has given you to minister to? Do you promise to pursue holiness, justice, righteousness, and joy within your relationship with God? Do you promise to practice the disciplines of the minister's life, correctly dividing the word of God, prayer, into the care of souls? And Do you promise, in word and deed, to live out the call God has given your life? I do. Yeah. Church, do you promise not to consume Tim, on his YouTube page, but to co-labor with him? Do you promise to encourage him, to bless him, and to love him and his family? Do you promise to pray for and worship with him? Do you promise to nurture his faith and care for his soul as he seeks out to live out God's calling on his life? We do with God's help. Thank you all for being here. Would you all join me in prayer? God, what a glorious night this is. God, in this place you are here and there is joy. Open our hearts to receive it. We are so grateful for Tim and his ministry among your people and the influence that Tim has around the world. And we pray that tonight, God, will be a blessing and one that he will remember the rest of his life after he said yes to the God who called. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Just stand and sing with us. Worthy of every song the name above every other name 
Jesus, the only one who could ever see. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. And Jesus, the only one who could ever see. And worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me and your love to those around me. And holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside. Open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
you. Thank you for being here. Thank you to my friends for leading worship. Um, I have had a very bad uh, allergy cold thing happen this week, so I, I apologize for my voice, but um, thank you, uh, Pastor Ray and uh, everyone at Grievewood. Uh, this is a gift. Um, I've been asked to, to share my testimony, and so I've, I've written this for myself. Life, I only got one word out. Life is a journey, and the path that, that led me to ordination has been a long and winding road. And I confess that I have often wondered what on earth God was up to along that path, um, but hindsight is twenty twenty. And as I stand here now and I, I look back, um, I can see God every step of the way, urging me to, to keep moving forward, to keep going one step at a time. One of my dad's favorite jokes is to tell someone, usually a waiter or a waitress, who is asking him if he needs anything, that he wouldn't mind a winning lottery ticket. Huh. We've all heard it a thousand times, and we know it's coming, <laughs> but we enjoy it nonetheless. And the truth is that I won the lottery when God chose to make Dennis and Donna Wildsmith my parents. I was raised in a loving and nurturing home that was deeply rooted in the Christian faith. Nearly every morning, I'm not making this up, when I came downstairs, I found my mother in the living room. We had one of those living rooms that was off limits that you weren't allowed to go into. Um, had the nice couch that you couldn't sit on. But she would be in there. She was doing one of two things. She was either on her knees praying or she was reading her Bible. Uh, she loves the word of God and she is a prayer warrior. My own love of scripture, my love of prayer are a direct result of the example set by her. My father is a man of action, and I watched him serve the, the church as a deacon, an elder, a committee member. He used his skills as a businessman to get churches out of debt, to help build a school for orphans in Haiti. And there was that one time he met a woman on an airplane, and he invited her to bring her children to our home on Christmas Day to celebrate Christmas with our family because her husband was undergoing cancer treatment at a nearby hospital. My love of, of service and my commitment to the local church are because of the example set by my father. So yeah, I won the lottery. We moved around a, a lot when I was a kid, but my parents always made it a priority to find a local church for our family, a place where uh, the word was preached and they had really great ministries for Emily and myself, good for whatever age of life we were at. It was during a three-year stint in the suburbs of Indianapolis that I made a decision to become a follower of Christ while we were members of Northside Baptist Church. Um, there was a guest preacher that Sunday, and, and something about the way he presented the gospel spoke to my nearly eight-year-old little heart. And encouraged by my mom, I walked down the aisle, I made a profession of faith, and in a, in a setting similar to this one, I was baptized uh, the next Sunday. Not long after that, we moved back to Omaha, Nebraska, and my faith really began to take shape while we were part of a church called Brookside. Um, I was in the Awana program. I started memorizing scripture when I was a kid for Awana, and um, my life totally changed when I got into the youth ministry, which was led by a man named John Alford, my youth pastor. Um, sorry, I'm going to try not to sniffle in the... I've got a clean.
John was a good youth pastor. We had lots of pizza. (laughs) But he also cared deeply about spiritual formation. In the 10th grade, I was uh, placed in in the small group of a youth intern at the time named Josh Hulling. Josh became like a big brother to me. He was a mentor and a friend. And I remember... He was young, but he was married, and his wife Emily was so awesome, and the two of them as a couple were so incredible, and I remember thinking, I want to have a marriage like that one day. It was at Brookside that I first uh, got a guitar and started leading worship, and I was terrible. But because of John and Josh's encouragement, I kept going. And I think that's when I truly first began to sense a call to ministry. It was when I was leading worship uh, for my high school youth group. In 2001, I moved to Nashville to attend Belmont University and um, quickly met a couple of men who invested in me. One was Dave Hunt, the university minister, and one was Dana Anthony, who's here tonight. I got involved in a Tuesday night worship service that met at First Baptist Nashville called Refuge. And uh, after a year of church hopping, I decided I should probably do what Josh did for me. I should go be a small group leader. And because I was hanging out at First Baptist on Tuesday nights, I decided to find the youth minister and then ask if I could hang out on Wednesday nights too. Um, uh, the youth minister at that time was Bryson Kessler, who's here with her family from Birmingham. And Bryson immediately welcomed me onto her team And soon after, found out that I could play the guitar and sing halfway decently. And so she made me the worship leader on Wednesday nights. We started a a Sunday night worship service. Uh, It was 2002, and we called it CD. Like, compact disc. It was bad. But it it stood for completely different. (laughs) And it didn't last very long. It was Bryson and told me that I had been given a gift as a worship leader and that she thought I should pursue it as a vocation. It was Josh, the youth intern, who was at that point a youth minister in Des Moines, Iowa, who hired me and gave me my first ever paycheck to lead worship for an event. Between Bryson and Dave Hunt and Josh, they started recommending me to other ministry leaders and I started traveling and leading worship and by the time I graduated from Belmont, I was, I was traveling all over the country leading worship for camps and retreats. And then John Alford, my, my high school youth pastor, invited me to come be on his staff in Omaha, Nebraska. So in the fall of 2005, I moved back to Omaha. I worked at Brookside as the student ministries worship pastor. And a couple of years later, I joined the staff of a, a church plant in the Acts 29 network called Core Community Church that was led by a man named Ethan Burmeister who also stepped into my life at a time where I needed much wisdom and guidance. He offered that to me with great empathy and kindness. At core, I learned what it looked like to live vulnerably in community with others, something that I continue to cherish. And God continued to shape me as a ministry leader. And that season of my life in Omaha also produced friendships, with other ministry leaders, two of whom have become lifelong friends that no amount of distance can come between. They started praying for me at like two o'clock at the kitchen table and I've been crying ever since. (laughs) And then 2011 happened. I knew God was preparing me for something But I had to go all the way to Hawaii to figure out what it was, who it was. If you've never heard the Hawaii story, you should ask because it's great. Her name is Becca. And she is God's greatest gift in my life. I know what you're all thinking. He's okay, but she's awesome. 
we dated in college. And then right before I moved back to Omaha, I broke up with her. I understand that that was dumb. <laughs> I spent nearly six years trying to find the one and comparing everyone who had potential to Becca. And then we reconnected. And I realized that she had been the one all along. And I will forever be grateful that God gave me that second chance. And this time I was not going to let her go. And that was the best decision of my life. She is the love of my life. She is my North Star. She's my encourager, my friend. And anything that I am as a minister of the gospel is directly tied to who she is. I spent my first two years back in Nashville when we got married working in the music industry. And being away from vocational ministry for the first time made me realize how much I loved it and how much I actually did feel called to it. Um, just a little over 10 years ago, in January of 2014, I was uh, laid off by a company that I was working for on Music Row. And I was quickly offered another job by another company on Music Row, but I turned it down and I told Becca, I'm, I think I'm supposed to be in ministry. Um, enter Brandon Owen. He's a good friend, former college roommate. At the time, 10 years ago, Brandon was on staff at Guess Where, First Baptist Nashville, the place I had worked during college and interned for three years with Bryson. And he invited me to come lead worship on Wednesday nights, just like I had in college. I was like, why not? I'll go do that. And then they fired up another one of those contemporary worship services and I started helping with that a little bit fellowship on Broadway R.I.P. <laughs> a few months later a few months later Brandon was moved into a new role and the church started looking for a youth pastor and um, I <laughs> I got a call from Tom Crow, the executive pastor, and he said, hey, you've been hanging out with the kids on Wednesday nights. They all know you. Will you be our interim youth pastor? And I promptly said, no. <laughs> I saw myself as a musician, a worship leader, not, not a pastor. That's what I told him. Um, but then they called back, and let me be honest with you, they offered me more money. <laughs> and I was unemployed. And so one of the biggest decisions of my life was made on that they offered more money. But I quickly realized that I would have done that job for free. It was within a, just a few weeks um, after youth group one night, I told Becca on our drive home, I'm going to be really sad when they find a new youth pastor because I absolutely love this job. And then a couple months after that, Pastor Frank Lewis took me to a lunch and informed me that the committee had selected me, even though I never applied for the job and I was woefully unqualified. <laughs> Um, and over the course of about six years at First Baptist Nashville, I, I truly began to embrace my calling for the first time. Mentored by men like Frank Lewis and Tom Crow, working alongside Brandon, Jason Cox, Matt Morris, Lori Towns, all people who are here tonight and many others an incredible staff there. Incredible church members. It was, and always will be, one of the best seasons of my life. I knew that I needed to deepen my well. And so with Pastor Frank's encouragement, I enrolled in the Master of Divinity program at Fuller Theological Seminary in 2016. But going back to school after nearly over, just over a decade and having a full-time job as a youth pastor was not fun. But I actually loved it. I fell more in love with the Bible and church history and the work of ministry. I fell in love with preaching. And it was during that season where I said, oh, this is who God created me to be. Remember, it's a long and winding road. 
oh, this is what I'm supposed to do. When my time at First Baptist came to an end in 2019, God graciously opened new doors. And Becca and I spent a short but life-changing season uh, in Oxford with incredible new friends and mentors. I started this little YouTube channel about the Bible that has grown. And in 2021, just a little less than three years ago, my old friend Dr. Christy Ridings at Belmont University called me and introduced me to Heather Doherty, the Reverend Heather Doherty, our university minister. They welcomed me onto their team, another interim role that became a permanent job. And being one of the campus ministers at Belmont, many Belmont students here tonight, has been such a great joy for me. And then as Pastor Ray shared one day at the back of the Belmont Chapel, I, I met Ray Miller. And for Becca and I, uh, the past two or so years here at Creevewood have been so meaningful. To this church family, to this community who has welcomed us and loved us. We love this place. We love this community. We love leading with Chris and Jody. We love serving alongside Ray and the staff here. Friends, this is my story. It's a long and winding road, and, and there are more names than the ones that I've mentioned. Many of your names at different places along the way. There are more moments of God's goodness and faithfulness in my life and I recognize that today is not the end of the journey that ordination is another another waypoint another stop along the way I am deeply humbled that you would all be here tonight I told Becca when we started singing that the only other reason I could think of that you would all show up like this is if I died Um, I asked I asked the band to lead that song uh, build my life because in all of this this story where I see God's grace woven through it where I see the, the people that he's blessed my life with woven through it um more than anything, I just want my life to be built on the truth and the love of Jesus. And for the overflow of my life and my ministry to, to let other people know that life with Jesus is better than life without Jesus. Thank you again uh, for being here. It means the world to me. Hello, I'm Heather Doherty. I work with Tim at Belmont. The first time I heard Tim's name was when Todd Lake excitedly told me during one of our weekly meetings that his kid's youth pastor had been on NPR, my favorite radio station, talking about faith and science and that I should definitely take a listen. I did listen then, and I went back and listened this week to make sure that it was Tim that you had told me about. And after knowing you for these past three years, it hit different. That's what my 13-year-old would say. It hit different to, uh, to be there. It was two years later. I wasn't, this isn't in my notes, and you know I don't go off my notes. But I was getting ready in the morning, and your name, having never met you, came to my mind. And we were in a time of big transition in university ministries. We were looking for someone who could come and help us. And... Your name popped into my head the morning as I was getting ready. I walked into the office that day, into Christy Riding's office, and said to her, do you think Tim Wildsmith would come and work with us? And she looked at me in the way that only Christy Riding's can and said, I'll talk to him. And when you meet with someone for the first time, you aren't sure what to expect we knew a lot of people, but I didn't know how he felt about people, and he wouldn't know how I felt about people, and so you do that dance when you first get to know someone. Weren't sure if we would like each other. 
would he think I was a nerd? Because I kind of am. Um, and I did ask him if I could say this. I saw his tattoos and knew that he loved coffee. And I was like, I think this is going to be okay. <laughs> we shared a vision for coming alongside college students and showing them the love of Jesus. And I am not hyperbolizing when I say that I believe that that afternoon meeting at Bongo Java was a God-ordained moment. I walked away from that meeting praying that Tim would feel the same way. It's now been almost three years since we've been working together. And in that time, Tim has become not just a colleague, but a true friend. He is always a team player. Maybe it's because I write his yearly evaluations, but Tim has never told me no. <laughs> He's always willing to jump in, to go above and beyond. He's up for whatever crazy idea I throw out. Our offices are next to each other. I walk in, sit down in the chair, and he's like, what's well, now? Uh, always willing to talk through a challenging situation. And when Tim shows up, he always brings his whole self. Tim, you are a true builder of community. The folks who have gathered here tonight to celebrate with you are a testament to that. You get to know people for who they are. You open your arms wide and you make a place for everyone. I have seen time and time again a student who isn't sure where they fit find community in you and through you. I'm also a little bit jealous of your ability to get students to do all kinds of things but it's because you have put in the time to build relationships with them and you make them feel seen and known. Tim, you are a lover of Jesus. Whether it's discipling students, preaching in chapel, teaching freshmen who don't really want to learn about it, about the Bible. He has some great stories. <laughs> uh, making videos about the Bible that a lot of people are watching at Christmas. My brother, who is a pastor, he was in Iowa, he's now in Wisconsin. He said, so do you know this guy named Tim Wildsmith? And I was like, I do. <laughs> I didn't get him a free Bible, but maybe there's still time. Uh, but, um, or leading worship, your love for Jesus and your commitment to faith are evident. And more than that, your life is a reflection of that love always pointing people to Jesus. As you are ordained today, I want to give you two challenges. And the first is to keep opening yourself to God's work in you. You are not the same person you were when I met you three years ago. I've seen you learn and grow and deepen your understanding of and commitment to God. And it is not easy to be open to that work it is hard and it is messy. But it is through continually allowing God to mold you and shape you that you will continue to be a faithful pastor and teacher. That's the most important thing. But this is a close second. Be you. It is so easy to get caught up in what other people think you should be or trying to fit the Baptist pastor mold, or to co contort yourself into something that you think that people want you to be. But Tim, being you, in all of your wild and quirky and corny and creative ways, is the only way that you can live into God's plan for your life and your ministry. And here is what I know and want you to hear today. That the church, the world, needs Tim Wildsmith, just as you are. I know that the road has not always been easy. And there have been times where you were sure that you had reached a dead end. But Tim, your life and your ministry are a testament to the goodness and faithfulness of God. As you walk in this new chapter... Remember that faithfulness. 
remember and cling to God's promise to never leave you or forsake you. I want you to stand up for just a minute and look at all the folks that are here today. I want you to know, Tim, that we're here because of who you are and the difference that you have made in our lives. And that every one of us who has gathered in this space are rooting for you and supporting you with our love. Congratulations. Good evening. My name's Brandon Owen. I'm so great, uh, grateful to be here. What an honor this is. And Heather, that was beautiful. It's good to see you. Uh, Ray, I, buddy, I miss you so much. I am so honored to be standing here in the pulpit that you inhabit. And I uh, appreciate your kind words. And I'm, I'm very grateful this worked out um, with Tim. And that brings us all here tonight. I miss you, Ray. And hope you're well. Um, Tim, buddy, I actually don't, I'm sad. I don't remember the day we met. Do you? You don't have to answer that. We talk about it later. But it's become a long time ago. And we became friends pretty quickly. I do remember that. And I'm glad we did. I was, I guess, three years ahead of you. Uh, Belmont, and uh, somehow we did end up living together for a semester, and that was such a, a joyful time. It was actually the semester that I met, or I was dating Leslie Ann, and and you, it was so cool to you were you were so excited about that for me. It was I know it was a shocker <laughs> to a lot to us, uh, but we we got engaged that that semester, I believe, or maybe got married that semester, yeah, and man, those are such good memories, Hillside, 25-something, <laughs> and, and for Leslie Ann and I to be such good friends with you and Becca to this day, she sends her love and wishes she could be here. Tim, you are such a wonderful creative, you are so creative, Tim, you are so intelligent but my favorite of your qualities that I have benefited from watching through the years you are patient and you are kind you have been kind to me I remember 2014 well and uh I don't know that you would remember this phone conversation. You wouldn't need to, but I happened to. I was in Gulf Shores, Alabama. I love to be in Gulf Shores, Alabama with my family. And we were, the timeline is fuzzy now, but we, we had begun fellowship on Broadway. And yes, I had been moved into a different role. And um, which, by the way, student minister at First Baptist, that's the best job I've ever had, too. And, and it was, I was sad to, it was just a lot of emotions during those years, but there was excitement ahead, we thought, and I just remember thinking, gosh, Tim would be so good, and this would be cared for so well, and it would be so fun to work together. And so, I don't know if you remember this, but I was jogging on the trail at the Gulf Shores, Orange Beach State Park, and we talked for about an hour that day while I was running struggling and my memory is I, I, I was trying to help you get your mind around what it could look like to be on staff at First Baptist Nashville because I knew how good that could be and I remember leaving that conversation so excited and so hopeful that you and I could be on staff together and we got to be for nearly five years from that point on I will always remember that conversation. I've always enjoyed so much, Tim, hearing your perspective on anything, your, your thoughts. 
Uh, you're one of my very favorite people to have a conversation with, whether it's about sports or just anything, especially about the church, especially about Jesus. And the longer I do this, not speak, I'm not going to speak that much longer, the longer I do this thing called ministry, being a pastor, the more I realize that one of the most important responsibilities of a pastor is to help along the community's conversation. It may be the most important role. A couple of things I've seen in you that inspire my confidence in your ability to continue to help along this conversation here or wherever God places you. You are such a good learner, man. You start with good questions and you go and find good answers. And in my experience, when you find those answers, you do not close yourself off to those good answers, not always looking exactly like they looked the first time you figured out they were good answers. They change over time as we change. As Heather said, you're not the same person as you were three years ago. As our understanding of God's ways becomes more expansive, as our stories open up and become bigger, as that long and winding road unfolds. I'm in awe, and always have been, of how good of a student you are. And that word, student, well, that is the most theological of words. You know, the one, capital O, who posed the very best questions and offered the very best insight through word and deed. You know him. You know him well. You follow him. You are being formed by him all the days of your life. Continue to be formed by him alone. Second, last. Man, I love your tone. I love your tone. We were, I don't remember what year it was. It was one of the years you sang in the, one of the showcases at Belmont. And I don't know if you'll remember this, but I do. It was, you know, this was a time where we had just figured out how to use video and leverage it in our concerts. And, and they, had, they had videoed all the participants in the, I guess it was the Christian Music Showcase. And they had asked you and the band, whoever was participating, what fulfillment was. You remember this? You had to define it. I have no idea how you defined fulfillment, Tim. I, I don't remember what your answer was. No offense. And I think you and I both would admit that whatever answer we would have given to that question 20 years ago would look quite a bit different now. And I think our 60-year-old selves may cringe at our 40-year-old selves for that matter, but I digress. What I do remember is what I was thinking as I listened to your answer on that video screen. I said, I like that answer. But it was not as much what you said. I don't even remember what you said. It was the way you said it. I was drawn to the way that you said what you said. I would encourage you, and I think you will, I know you will, to be open, to continue to be open to others as you've been open to me. When you do this work, I mean, I feel so much pressure. I put it on myself day in and day out to, to have the right answers, you know? And you, you're my guy that I can confess that to. You, for the last 10 years, really, have joined me in that conversation as I have begun to understand more and more that I actually don't have to know everything. That certainty is not the Holy Grail. And that God is meeting us daily, manna from heaven, to do this work to love the church, and to be exactly who God's called us to be. Thank you for the way you've encouraged me. The great Fred Craddock once wrote of an experience he had serving on a pastor search committee for a particular church. When discussing the traits the committee would want to find in the candidate, Craddock said this. He said, even before we determine how skilled a preacher 
he or she is. And if you know Craddock, you know that was of infinite importance to him. Or how good the person is with pastoral care or any of the other responsibilities that may be on that job description for that pastor. Before any of that, I want to know one thing. Is this person grateful? Are they a person of gratitude? That is the first and most important thing. And what a blessing to hear you give your testimony. I didn't know you were going to do that. You're a person of gratitude, Tim. Continue to be so. And I am so grateful to be your very good friend. It's always a danger when you allow three preachers in a row to talk. Because you give them a time limit of five to seven minutes, and God blesses it and gives them 15. Uh, but Tim is worth every minute. It's worth every minute. My job is to talk to the church and give charge to the church. I've got three words for you, church, tonight. And your relationship with Tim. Partner, praise, and pray. Partner, praise, and pray. Oftentimes when, when Paul writes, uh, in Philippians 1, he says, uh, I pray for you always, always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. That word partnership uh, is also sometimes translated fellowship in the original language. Uh, when I think of fellowship, I think of cookie bars, which we're about to enjoy just a little while from now. Uh, but that's not what Paul was writing about. What Paul was writing about uh, was about putting your money in your life, in your talent where your mouth is and they people would partner together for a common purpose this was a koinonia this was fellowship and the common purpose was the partnership in the gospel over and over again Paul in his letters pointed out people and this is what he called them he called them co-laborers called them partners fellow workers with Christ Jesus these people were not consumers. They were co-laborers with Christ. And so church, partner with Tim. I, gotta t I, gotta, I have to admit, Tim is the second most talented person I've ever worked with in my life. Becca is number one. <laughs> and so, and so it's, easy, it's easy to want to consume Tim, to hear his preaching, to hear his uh, incredible uh, talks about the God Bless America Bible, which over 300,000 people have watched. Uh, it's easy to consume Tim, but don't do that. Partner with him. Partner with him in learning to love God better. Partner with him in the mission that God has for us in this world. And praise. Not praise in the sense that we would praise Jesus. Not praise in the sense that we would worship anything. That the only one is worthy of all of our praise. But praise in the sense of encouragement. Encourage him. Come alongside him. Take him to lunch sometime. Get to know him. Ask him about his tattoos. He'll tell you. Praise him. Now, that doesn't mean if you have an issue to not come up to him and not talk to him about it. No, we need to live in vulnerable community. It doesn't mean that uh, you stray away from maybe hard conversations, but it's easy today to be hypercritical of people in our fast-paced, hurried culture. Instead, do the hard work of coming alongside and encourage somebody. It's a lot harder to build people up, but it's way more worth it. Partner, praise, and then pray. Paul ends his letter uh, to Colossians, asking the Colossians to keep watch and be thankful and pray. And pray for him that he might have opportunity. Spread the gospel. 
So I'm going to invite you to pray. Pray for Tim. As, yes, he has conversations online in his, in his YouTube platform that's going to give him opportunities that we can't imagine. Pray for him when he deals with college students who are walking through uh, the growth process that becomes with a college student. Pray for him as he prepares uh, his heart for worship. Pray for him in his marriage. Pray for him as he's living his life. Because the best thing you can do for somebody is to put them in the hands of God. Partner. Praise. Pray. And then get out of the way and watch what God's going to do through Tim Wildsmith. Tim, we're going to enter into a sacred time now. It's the time of laying on of hands. And Jason, if you want to come up and play if you want. But I, we have two chairs here. One for Tim and then Becca, I'm going to invite you to come up here as well. And how we're going to do this, we're going to do ordained people first. Um, and then uh, after some of those have gone through, uh, anybody else who would love to come up and, and lay hands and pray for Tim, you are more than welcome to. To prevent mass chaos, I'm going to ask you all who are going to come through to come down this aisle, my left, your right, and then to go this way and then back to your seat. Okay? Does that sound like a plan? Okay, I'm going to start us off, and then you all can line up uh, kind of behind me uh, coming down this aisle. So whoever would like to lay hands on Tim, this is your chance.
Thank you. 
think we'll end on mom. I know that a lot of y'all else would love to, to come and talk with Tim, but there are cookie wait, cookies waited on us downstairs. Um, I know it's been a special time. Thank you all for coming to this very, very special day. Uh, Tim, we do have a couple of gifts for you. Uh, one is a certificate of ordination um, that your ordination council signed to help you remember for this day. Let's get a picture here. Yeah. And then, then, what do you give a guy getting ordained that has all the Bibles in the world? How about another Bible? So it is customary uh, when somebody is ordained, and at least in my Baptist tradition, to hand them an ordination Bible. So Tim, your wife had some help, mostly did most of this, but uh, picking up this. But here is uh, your ordination Bible. Yeah. You can wait. You've been better. Thank you all once again for coming. We do have a fellowship. Uh, it's in our fellowship hall. For those of you unfamiliar with Cleveland Baptist Church, the best way to get there is out this door right here. And then there's a stairwell to your left. You take those stairs down, turn left again, and hopefully you'll smell some cookies. Uh, they'll be over there. If you need an elevator, there's an elevator down uh, over here to the right, and uh, you can go down on the first floor and then turn left and just kind of follow your way down to the kitchen from there. Thank you all once again for being here tonight, for Tim, for Becca, and most of all for Jesus, uh, and uh, the author and finisher of our faith. If you would, allow me to bless you and we'll be dismissed. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.